Philadelphia, are you ready? <laughs> no, he said, are you ready? This is Brotherly Love Wrestling Podcast, your first stop for everything professional wrestling. So sit back and enjoy wrestling talk at its finest with your hosts, Larry Hall and Joe Corrado. Welcome, everybody, to Brotherly Love Wrestling. And on today's show, we have the golden grappler, Travis Huckabee. Travis, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I'm glad we finally got this worked out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if we want, I guess we could tell everyone on the, the, the podcast that our original idea was to do a, a together podcast where we get all these local uh, talent around and we do it, we eat cheesesteaks while we talk wrestling. And it was going to be called Wrestling With or Without. And this, yep. was, this was supposed to be our, our kickoff to that. And then. COVID hit and schedules got messed up and God knows when we can actually see people. And this is what we got. We got a regular show. Not, yeah. not, not even to mention that uh, my favorite place to get a cheesesteak, as soon as I told you guys, found out that it closed down. So, Yeah, and that was going to be our first time because we were going to all get it from the same place and we were going to do the vegan cheesesteaks with you. And that was going to mm-hmm. be our first time having vegan cheesesteaks. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was really disappointed. I've never had one, so I was kind of excited to see what it would taste like and kind of bummed it didn't happen. Oh, my God. I'm bummed that Govinda's is close. <laughs> that, that was soul crushing. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, not just in a wrestling standpoint that, that what's going on. Like, I mean, I'm sure it's kind of the same. Like, smaller wrestling promotions aren't able to run, so they are running the same risk of being having to shut down or go out of business, just like small businesses – especially in our city they're all taking a hurt or a hit mm-hmm. yeah so, so travis i do want to before sorry joe i didn't mean to cut you no, off. That's a- um one thing with the being in the, from the philadelphia area there was a promotion that had now closed for other reasons that a lot of wrestlers in the philadelphia area shikara um were around and, and you were one of them to to come from shikara and there were so many good professional wrestlers coming out of Shikara and great characters and stuff like that. It's good to see that even throughout this, we've seen people pop up at all kinds of different other promotions, such mm-hmm. as like Limitless Beyond and other things like that, to where we get to see everybody still. And that's a good thing for at least the Philadelphia wrestling that a lot of you guys are, are seen all over the place now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be... I was just going to say, I couldn't be more grateful for those places that have been, that have, you know, sort of opened their doors for us. And uh, I don't know when this will go out or anything, but uh, take Limitless, for example, just the opportunities I had there. Those are some of my favorite matches that I've had in a while. And I'm incredibly excited for people to actually get to see some of them. But yeah, there's been a lot of people from the from that promotion going out. Uh, uh, I know Mikowski was at Beyond. There were uh, some of us uh, made that trip to Pizza Party, and you know, a handful of other places. Now, do you feel like that these were some of your best matches because you're not able to wrestle as much as you'd like to, and maybe because you're at a different place and the excitement and the energy is like almost like starting anew. Yeah. I think that is a pretty good way of putting it. I remember I, I'm not even sure. Uh, I'm not even sure when it hit, but uh, I went up there and, you know, you put on the gear and everything and you're, you're standing around the locker room. I think I had this just insane, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, energy. Even when, even when I wasn't wrestling for a few hours, I was just standing there. It was like, I'm just happy to be around it again. 
And I think that I think that shows now. Like, if you're actually really looking for it, you can tell like someone that hasn't gone in a while, and they're they're like that energy and that like it's just like infectious throughout anyone who's watching it. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't I didn't want to uh, like backtrack on the Shakar because it was mentioned. And what were your initial reactions and and feelings and just anything that was going on in your head when everything kind of went down? There was, there was so much that just take in of it. Uh, I I'm still having my own sort of time kind of processing it. You know, this was, a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, Jakarta was one of the things that really made me want to be a wrestler. Uh, you know, depending on how much you know about uh, my personal taste and my career or whatever. Uh, I went to Chicago shows back in 2008, 2009. Uh, and that was at a time when, I was really kind of getting disillusioned with a lot of the stuff that I was seeing on TV. So I saw this alternative and it just encaptured me. So it was one of those things where, you know, I wanted to do this thing for, uh, when, when did I start? Uh, something like 60 years before I actually started. And then, you know, I'm doing it. I get to be a part of it. And then, you know, things shut down and, I, I'm not here to make opinions one way or another about about a closing or anything that happens. I, of course, feel for all those people, like all the victims and everything, and I'm not going to say anything one way or another. It's just, it was a lot to really just take in. Yeah, it, it was, it, it, it hits close to home for, for all, all of us in the area too, because I mean, it was like it was like one of our home promotions. It was like mm-hmm. one of the the last things of Philadelphia. Like that was a, a major wrestling thing, and now yeah. we're kind of all we're kind of and it's Philadelphia. When people think Philadelphia and wrestling, obviously they think ECW, and it was like the diehard fan. So we get that reputation just like we do in any other sport in Philadelphia. We get that reputation to be absolute nut jobs, and we are to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think in a good way, and then. When this happened, it's kind of like, ah, oh, it's like that lit. Because Shakara just had a nice crop of young talent come in and to mix in with all the other people that they had still. I mean, it was almost like, oh, man, they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was like, you could feel like Philly's like fucking coming back again in the wrestling room. And he's like, it's crushing. It's it's crushing on a lot of different levels just to, to hear what had happened and how everything went down. And just like, oh, man. I was like, why couldn't he just said he went bankrupt? Yeah, it's – I guess the people I feel for most are a lot of the a lot of the students, a lot of the rookies. There were uh, – not that – I'll tell you a little bit about sort of the, the workings or whatever, but there were two main sort of times in the year when you would see people debut. You would see people debut at the season open – or you would see them debut right around uh, Chikarosaurus Rex King of Trios time. Mm-hmm. That's just the way that uh, that's just the way that we sort of did things. And just the unfortunate of it is that there were some people who they were ready for some time and they just didn't get to debut. You can look at people like Green Ant. He was ready for a very long time before he actually debut just because it didn't fit in that sort of calendar time but that's that's neither here nor there there were a lot of people who i think were very close to uh being ready if not being ready that were set to debut and then everything hit things shut down and you've got these people who committed this large chunk of time of their life into all this training and you know they're they busted their butts. Uh, if you take someone like Pancakes, uh, he was probably going to be the next person to be able to go out and do something. And it feels like that was sort of taken from him. Uh, 
just a lot of these people. I absolutely feel for them. Yeah, and to debut on a platform like Shakara's is a big deal. I mean, that's not like some promotion that's not getting any video time or not doing anything like that, and only 35, 40 people are going to say this is like, because this is going to be on independent TV or the Shakara's website. Yeah. So your, your audience is a lot broader, not to mention uh, 100, 200 people that are going to be there live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I absolutely love the, love the crowd that we had uh, at the factory when we had those, we had those events. Uh, there were some, there were a lot of people that really kind of attached to what was going on. And you would see a lot of like these, regular yeah. sort of people who were there and committed and you know what it, it's funny because at, well, probably 90 percent of the people that were there knew the storylines knew what was going on knew everything that had played out but the people that were coming in that maybe hadn't it was easy to pick up on and it was yeah. such it was such simple but effective storytelling like you could tell like okay these are the bad guys these, this mm -hmm. is a clear bad guy these are the clear favorites i mean everything was like if you didn't know the actual storyline so to speak you could still be invested in what was going on yeah and what was going on in the ring and the crowd reaction it was it's just it was a very unique crowd mm -hmm. you can in the in the greatest way i could possibly describe that <laughs> i i absolutely love those fans i miss them every single day yeah uh, well, so, uh, one more. I just want to build a little bit more onto this, Larry. So, what? Ahead, how how do we get Philadelphia back? Like, how do we how do we get to a point of where we can get? Because a lot of the people didn't leave the area. They just they're wrestling other places that are kind of still in the Northeast or close, mm -hmm. at least hour or two, maybe five hours away. Like, how do we get everyone back to where they should be? Like, is it? Do you have any? Have you heard anyone starting up anything new or any talks about? The closest sort of thing that I know about is uh, we've got Camp Leaf Frog. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. yep. have watched any of that, but that's very entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. That was something started up uh, uh, by Chris Levin, and he had a lot of help from the high tension wrestling guys. That uh, they have been doing their their damnedest to find a new home for a lot of a lot of people like myself a lot of the kind of cast outs from the Chikara shutdown and I know uh, Chris has got a lot of ambitious ideas for it so it's gonna come down to people like that it's gonna come down to those sort of uh, companies trying to weather this storm and trying to bring something positive out of all the the ashes of just garbage piled I mean, on i mean it's good it, it is it's really good because i have watched camp leapfrog and i've watched uh, the pizza party show that had featured a lot of the the shakar people that i knew and mm -hmm. it was nice to see that at least you guys and girls are still able to go out there and we're still able to because you're if you're streaming on independent wrestling tv i'm gonna be able to catch it because i i rarely miss anything that i want to see on there mm -hmm. it's just it's one of the easiest things like oh notification it's on i'm watching it i mean at go. least they were able to do that mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a tough thing for philly just with everything that happened but it's a tough thing for the wrestling scene in general it's really going to be tough until things can return to some sort of normalcy. Yeah, which eh, I don't know if we have anytime soon. Like, this is almost like the new normal right now that we're in. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is scary. Like, if you, can, <laughs> if you can only have, like, 30 people, if that, or you have to do a, a live taping with nobody there, I mean, that's almost becoming the new normal. And that's just from – the highest point all the way down to the lowest of low promoters. I mean, that's yeah. just what it is. Especially this yeah. time. Oh my goodness. It's, 
it's such a tough sort of spot, but I don't know, just even running shows in general is, is really so, so dodgy at this point, but a lot Mm -hmm. of the places that have been, have been jumping through hoop after hoop after hoop, like more props to those guys uh, for doing these things responsibly, you know, everyone getting tested, everyone having to follow strict sort of protocols about everything. And Travis, you talked about the wrestling scene and and, uh, the way it is right now and how it's in a, it's in flux as of this point, obviously, because of what's going on. But when you look at something, when you look at mainstream wrestling and what happened this past week of a Kenny Omega going to an impact wrestling and showing up on impact. And now it looks like AEW might be doing a one-off with impact wrestling. And now the, the wrestling world's a buzz of different companies working together and maybe all this happening. It has to be at least look like a bright spot for, for wrestlers in general that where when things like this start happening, more opportunities come where you guys can get into these companies and and more stuff opens up. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, is that until you literally just said it, maybe it was just the, the, the whatever sort of morbid mentality I got in. I had forgotten all about that, but that's, that's such a good point. It's there was so much about that night, like you know, not even mentioning Sting. I'm sorry, sorry to freak out for a minute, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's insane to think of those sort of possibilities. Uh, it's at least in that aspect, it's so exciting, and it's one of those things that actively makes you want to see what happens next. Yeah. And it's, it's happened on the, the indie scene a little bit. I mean, I know Beyond and GCW have teamed up and done shows like that. Like, what's to stop, like, small promotions that are afraid of going under to kind of grab onto someone a little bit stronger financially and kind of run a dual show? I mean, it, it, it would benefit everybody, I feel. I mean, yeah. you're going to get fans of two promotions. You're going to get uh, – money from two separate places you're going to get a larger uh viewership i mean it makes sense and it'd be fun to see like these smaller companies run shows together and i mean maybe that's a way to get it back into the philadelphia scene yeah it's those sort of things are always a gamble i know uh you know maybe a couple years ago was uh chikara had their sort of feuding with beyond Mm-hmm. thing happening and for that for that instance it didn't work out that great I think some of it just had to do with style I think when Beyond came and had a show at the Wrestle Factory in front of the normal Wrestle Factory fans right after a Chikara show uh, I think that was a little rough just it's not what they're used to seeing mm-hmm. Uh so that was a gamble that didn't pay off, but I think uh, done in probably a better way, it really, you really do have those crazy possibilities. Yeah, I, we were actually at that show that you were talking about. Yeah. And it, it was funny because every time that uh, Beyond would put out a tweet like, oh, where should we go next? I was like, I would always, <laughs> I would always make sure I responded, like, when are you coming back to Philly? And he's like, <laughs> When you can fill a crowd for me, I was like, oh, damn. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> the funny thing is, I remember being on that show, too. Uh, I think that was the tag team tournament for tomorrow. Uh, it, was, where, it, was either, it was either you and Icarus or you and Deppin. It, might it was you me and Deppin versus uh, the Jollyville boys. Yeah, yes. he is. Jollyville. Wait, you can curse. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Jollyville <laughs> fuck. It's, you're good. <laughs> I'll allow you guys to. It's, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Anytime I, I have the thought that my mom could possibly watch the watch okay. an interview, I I try to refrain from it. We got you. Yeah, I've gotten to the point of where I've accepted that my mother <laughs> will will listen, and she's gonna just have to deal with it. 
The funny thing is, is that when growing up, she would curse. So, I mean, at this point in my life, I'm like, come on, Ma, really? You're going to be the one to tell me? <laughs> yeah, to, to this day, I do not think uh, I have cursed in front of my parents. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. That is yeah, impressive. There might, there no, might it's, be... like, it's almost like you were training for Shikari your whole life. <laughs> 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 uh anyway back to the back to the match uh i remember being there and you know we had that match and the beyond style itself is very is very kind of intense and there's a lot of people trying to bring out all the stops and there's a lot of like bam 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 boom boom ah 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 chop 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 dump on your head, dump on your head, dump on your head. Uh, it was a lot of that after people had already watched an entire other show uh, where I think just a lot of people were exhausted. And then you would see Orange Cassidy and Stokely Hathaway. And... Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> I mean, really. Actually, was it Orange Cassidy? It was Stokely Hathaway and someone. It was, it was Orange yeah. Cassidy and Janela. Versus versus um, it was. I think it was hot sauce and someone. It might have been hot sauce and someone. I think it might have been hot sauce. Yeah, I can't remember who the other person was though. I don't think it was Utes. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so either. I remember. It was – I definitely remember Janela and, and uh, Orange Cassidy. Mm -hmm. So who would – who would uh, ha, who would Stokely been been uh, affiliated with at that time? Dream Team? That, uh, that might have been it. Yeah. Yeah, because that's right before he signed. It wasn't mm -hmm. long after that and he signed. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, Orange, Orange Cassidy has that, like – I know he has no energy – in the ring and that's his that's his thing but the energy he draws from the crowd is ridiculous for what he does and how he does it to get that reaction from he, Arch Cassidy is a genius he really is like it the people that say negative things about his work rate or whatever the hell you want to call it it's just like he got over on the highest level mm -hmm. in front of tens of thousands of people and did nothing Yes. Like literally he did nothing. <laughs> you can look at sort of anyone that's made any sort of any sort of impact on at least the independent scene. And a lot of the biggest people are the ones who had these over the top personas. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Warhorse, Effie, and Danhausen. Mm -hmm. They're probably some of the top people on the independents and just like what they do they know what they're doing they know what they're doing at least as far as what they do yeah uh, character work character yes, work is they, on point yes they know every single niche every single little detail of what they do and you know it's something that's easy for people to understand uh and you almost get that sort of fulfillment when you know what's gonna happen and then it happens and especially if it's just all the more outrageous, like, you know, that orange gas is going to do everything he can to do as little as humanly possible. So even when he does big things, it looks like just lazy. He could do the suicide dive with his hands in his pocket. And, and it's just. <laughs> Explode. That's yeah. it's, it's the satisfaction of knowing that that is, 100% something that he would do and then to just see it. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny because the character work doesn't get enough praise right now. Like a lot of the praise goes to the the high spots and the the big spots and all that crazy shit, but the character work is is someone that you don't even have to see them in the ring. All they have to do is present themselves and you're automatically locked in. Like they, it can be like a 2 second match, but you were locked in for every bit of what they were about to do or what they were saying. And the, the three people at plus Orange Cassie that you brought up, they get that. Like, 
They're not there to put on a six-star match in the Tokyo Dome. They're there because of their character work and how over they are before they even get in the ring. Now, granted, yep. they know what they're doing once they get in, inside the ring, but you, are you really there for that at that point? You're more there for that person, that person who they're playing. Yeah. That act. Yeah. I had a, just the other day, someone had asked me a question of where I can imagine wrestling being 10 years from now. Oh. And, and I absolutely love that question because it just made me think about it. There was, I feel like you're just going to see such a diversification of what people like and what, you know, they enjoy seeing. Like, I think you're going to see these people that are over the top. You're going to see even more of that. You're going to see some of these characters. You're going to see your Orange Cassidy's and you'll see the people that were inspired by Orange Cassidy. But then you'll see uh, some of the most crazy athletic acrobatic things in the world uh you know people inspired by ricochet and will osprey you'll see the people like absolutely murdering themselves just work rate everyone who was watching adam cole or that like your kenny omegas your whomever your preference is i think you're gonna see some of these things just branch off and become that much more that <laughs> I think right. you're gonna. I know. I know you just named a bunch of different styles, but there's one that you left out, and this is very important, so it doesn't die away. The Daniel Bryan, Drew Gulak, the Zack Saber Jr., the Jonathan Gresham. You yourself have harbored this style of technical wrestling, and what it's it seems to be the lost art. Oh, definitely. The least appreciated, I will say, a hundred percent. The least appreciated. Mm -hmm. But when you see it and you're it, it, it's like nothing else because you can see the story and it's slow enough that you can appreciate it. But it's not mm -hmm. too slow to where there's no action. And you're going to fall asleep. Like yeah. The, all, all the people that I just mentioned, I can't imagine seeing a match and, be like, and not being like jaw on the floor the whole time. They didn't, they didn't even go off the top rope. Mm -hmm. Not one of them. Not one of them did a dive. Well, maybe Daniel yeah. Bryan, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. But I mean, it's just like it's. It's the lost art of, of professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's the, that's the part that can't die. Because when you're naming all these other like athletes who are incredible, the one that rarely gets mentioned is that style. Mm -hmm. I think that that type of wrestling is going to be put in a very interesting place. When I think of technical wrestling, I tend to branch it into two categories. You'll see – People like Zack Sabre Jr., Jonathan Gresham, uh, to maybe a lesser extent, some of the NXT UK, UK guys, uh, they've got that very elegant sort of flow, uh, especially people like Gresham and Zack Sabre Jr. is very much that hold, counter hold sort of chess match. But then, you know, so those are your technical chain wrestlers. And then you've got the, I call them the grapplers, your your Drew Gulaks, your uh, a lot more pure kind of, uh, I think like Timothy Thatcher, I think of a lot of those more gritty kind of forearm in the face, just grinding it. A fighter uh, that can also take you down. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we might see a further kind of divide in that. Uh, my sincerest hope is that they do maintain the sort of spirit of it. I think it's so easy to see an elaborate escape, an elaborate counter, and just do it for the move while not understanding how or why it works. Uh, that's going to be the sort of thing to struggle to keep alive, I think. It will be, but the people that will do it. I think it will be a shock for all those people that you see doing the flips and the dives and the crazy ass fast paced moves. When you do see a move like that, it kind of puts you like, Whoa, I think it still does to, to a certain extent for everybody. Like you'll see something be like, Whoa, shit. Like that was cool. And they didn't have to jump five stories. Yeah. I was, I was just catching up on the, on the recent war games right before uh, getting on this talk with you guys. And, you know, there are those guys, the, the Kyle O'Reilly's and the, uh, Pete Dunn's. 
the things mm-hmm. that they were doing. It was, it was watching, the, watching the first five minutes of that match where it was just the two of them mm-hmm. and they were going back and forth. And it was, it had that sort of elegance. It had that kind of style. And I was, I don't think it was just because of the type of wrestling that I enjoy, but I was drawn into it. It's one of those things you can't help, but to watch when Pete Dunn is doing whatever sort of thing to <laughs> manipulate a joint, you're almost watching just to see like, Oh my God, that was gross. What's he going to do? <laughs> I, I said that to Larry when we were watching it, like we were doing the same thing we're doing now. I was talking through zoom. I was like, this has been an incredible technical wrestling match inside of two rings surrounded by a cage. Cause the amount, the, the, the people that were in there besides Don and O'Reilly, I mean, you have the Bobby Fishers who throws in more of a striking, but mm-hmm. still technical style. I mean, uh, then you got fucking Roderick strong who, yeah, he can do all the holds and all that, but he could also throw you around. Like, I feel like that style might be the style to break through. Like the the person that can technically wrestle, but that they can also throw you and do all those mm-hmm. like backbreakers, suplexes, and stuff like that. Like it's like a power technician. Yeah, that's that's some of the stuff that I absolutely love. I think there's people like Oni Warkin who I very much think does that with not quite the same sort of elegance you'll see but he's very much smash you in the mouth, technical, he'll throw you as well. I think he's so underappreciated. Like There's even, a, even as NXT tag champion, I think he's underappreciated. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. And I think, I think wrestling needs more of those smash you in the mouth. Like guys that you're actually afraid of, like, oh shit, this guy might knock my teeth out. Like people that are, mm-hmm. and, and on the counter end, you need someone who's legitimately scared of that. You need someone who's yeah. going to react in the way that they should not get hit and then run to the corner to run out and do a, a Spanish fly. Like you need people that are like that playing both ends of that. Like that's how it really works. Yep. And I think yep. we were talking about the selling aspect yesterday about selling and wrestling and how, yeah, that's why I'm drawing the technical wrestling because there, you have nothing to do, but sell. If you're in a freaking submission hold, if you're tied up and you can't move, like you have no, you can't just sit there like a dead fish. Like you have to do something. You have to show emotion. You have to show that shit, this hurts. Funny thing is, is that with any of my students, that's one of those things that I'll always drill in on that that they have to be doing something. It's like, I know, I know every match starts with a wrist lock, hammer lock, head lock by like obligation, but (laughs) you know, never just stand there with, with your hands down like this and, you know, you're bent over at the waist and just like you look bored to be there. It, there's it gets, so many like little things that those great technicians do uh, as they're selling, as they're applying holds, you know, my uh, take Drew Gulak, for example, you mentioned him earlier. Yay, Philly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's, there's so many little things that he's kind of imparted to me. It's just simple things that you don't realize that you realize at the time. He's got, uh, he's got facial expressions down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's so- got facial expressions. He's got body language. He's someone that's actually studied body language. Uh, he's had conversations where he's pointed things out like, uh, just what people are doing like he knows very much what he's doing yeah i think with with wrestling wrestling in general and obviously but like technical wrestling especially the thing is when you're watching it and you're seeing the person sell and you're seeing that look you know what it would be like to be choked you know what it'd be like for have your arm wrapped in a pretzel like you know that shit hurts so if you're you're not going to buy into a guy laying on a mat who's not selling that you're not going to buy it you're instantly going to disconnect from the match so when you have guys that do it as well as gulak and, and others it's just it makes the entire match that much better and people and especially like you said come wrestlers coming into wrestling that's one thing that i'm glad to see 
more and more that they are doing that and you get to see them selling more because it just, it'll lose a lot of fans just by, I mean, disinterested. Yeah. I think uh, something that sort of goes to their credit, uh, which might be something that gets overlooked. uh, There are a lot of people that, well, maybe this is my own separate sort of psychology on uh, the moves that I do, but any sort of thing that I do where I want it to look uh, anything where I, I do uh, I try to have it have a certain look to it. And I try to think very much of things that are relatable. I think the sort of brilliant thing about uh, just using him again, as an example, you take someone like Pete Dunn who will do the joint manipulation. You'll do all of that. I think everyone understands on at least a fundamental idea what this feels like, what, you know, getting something smashed feels like. And that's something that I think gets overlooked. Just the choices made in general. I think it's really easy to see something where someone's in a weird thing and whatever, a legs up here, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it could look like just, I don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, Jericho said something that was funny like uh, his finishing move now is just a spinning back elbow and the reason that he did it is because everybody knows what it's like to get hit in the mouth with an elbow and that's the reason like yeah I could do a flip and land on you but not everyone knows what that feels like yep. you can imagine it but everyone knows what it feels like to get hit with like an elbow whether it be on purpose or by accident Mm-hmm. Imagine on purpose someone's spinning and hitting them in the face like it's just some simple things like that people that I, don't watch and they watch now they're like oh yeah i get that that probably hurt like hell mm-hmm. i i love doing like the little bit where someone tries climbing the rope and it's like haha no you don't and then i just <laughs> yank their leg out and they take a awkward step i think that's one of those things that you just register and you know exactly what that's like to land weird and then you tweak your knee it's that sort of stuff that I absolutely love because of those very reasons that's relatable i'm glad you just brought that up because i again i think i mentioned this to larry yesterday too like i i love it when people don't let someone get to the top rope or they let them get to the top rope and they stop it because nowadays everyone's getting to the top rope and it's easy and you're able to stand there and get ready and do your move. i love it when people are like there's people watching this right now that why would I let this guy have this much time to get up there and people will go up and they'll swipe the leg or they'll do something. Like, I think that that is a lost art in wrestling. Like I'm not going to give you the chance. Like I see you, I'm four feet from you. All I have to do is pull my arm out and hit your leg. Mm-hmm. Like, I love that. It's, yeah. I, I know there's a, there's a chance that someone's going to get hurt or the, the risk factor is high, but so is jumping off of the top rope as well. So, I mean, I love that when, especially a heel, when a heel does it, like it just makes sense. It feels right. My my single favorite thing is when I see someone just step out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. We said exactly. that last night too. I said that last night. When someone nonchalant, like, oh, I see, I see this guy coming up. Nope. Not gonna do it. Like I think that it's so smart too. Like, yeah, you're just gonna jump on me. Nope, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, my single favorite thing to see happen. <laughs> I mean, Orange Cassidy comes to mind with that. I mean, he just puts his hand <laughs> in his pocket and walks away. I mean, oh, yeah. that's priceless. And it's it makes sense. Like, it makes sense to someone, like, see someone. Like, I saw you this whole time. I'm not going to stand here and let you do it. Mm-hmm. That's great. Especially, uh, it could be for, it could be when you outsmart someone or when you've got that obnoxious character who's just so over the top. Like, I would love to see you know, back when he was wrestling, but Stokely, he would be someone who would climb up the top and he would make such an outrageous show out of it. And then all you would have to do is step out of the way and he would just have those reactions that only he could have. (laughs) And, you know, that'd be a very easy way to just, you know, kind of get everyone just to get a laugh at him. Yeah. It gets, it get if you weren't invested, it gets you reinvested into the match. Like mm-hmm. you get to the point where like, oh, that was funny as shit. Now, now I'm reinvested <laughs> again. And you now, because Stokely, for people that are watching this and don't know Stokely Hathaway, now uh, Malcolm Bivens, I mean, 
he was a guy that you love to hate and he was a guy that ran his mouth and he was that he was that like kind of like Paulie dangerously like he's a guy that ran his mouth he was good on the mic he was all he was he you knew who he was a bad guy who he was rooting for he was gonna do what he could to, to interfere and then we started wrestling you wanted to see him get punched in the mouth mm-hmm. so yeah he had that uh he had that bit and beyond where uh, I think they finally had it was like Dickinson or it was uh Nick Gage or someone just like power bombed him and that was just such that fulfilling kind of uh, fulfilling thing to see. It's that thing in, in wrestling, like when you you know who the bad guy is, and when they finally they get over so much, and they get one over, and they get one over, and then they finally get that that ass beating that you want them to get. It's just like ah, oh, this is the reward at the end of the yeah. story. Yeah, you had those people like Larry Sweeney, who was such a master at everything that he did. You talking about that just made me think of there was there was something that was either Chikara or Ring of Honor where he was giving Sarah Del Rey a hard time and you just wanted so hard to see her just beat the ever loving life out of him. I think when she finally when she finally did, that was such a fulfilling moment. And it, it gets harder and harder nowadays to remember, like, when was the last time you saw it? When was the last time we saw anything, like, where that, that weasel was around so often that they finally – because everyone wants to pay off right away. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like people have grown impatient. They just want to get to that next. They don't let stories tell out. And I think that was the great thing about Chikar is that we knew the stories were going to be drawn out. We knew that they were season-long stories that ended at the end. You knew you mm-hmm. had to you had to invest yourself in that, and it was nice. Like nowadays, when you see wrestling, like you're hoping, like, oh, we get like a couple weeks, and then it's over, and then it's over. Dude, why are they doing the same thing over and over again? Like the impatience for like, given granted, some of the stories aren't that great, so you're kind of like, okay, next. Mm-hmm. But to run a story with talented people, you don't want to see that end right away. Yeah, I I think my entire story for one of the seasons or at least the entire half the year uh uh was between me and my former tag partner solo darling that was something that played out over that was was a a very very good storyline yep yeah that was something that it took its it took some sweet time with what are we what episode are we on larry 170 something uh this is yeah this is 172 and we had Solo somewhere in the 60s. Yes. Okay. And, that was, and that was right before her title shot. And that was right as that whole storyline was kind of wrapping up. Yes. And she went in, she went in depth about that storyline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's – that was something that just – I'm trying to even think of the way to describe that. That's something that just sort of ended up happening uh, – and I think that goes to, you know, her credit and the credit of everyone involved of just how well that ended up playing out. We hated you. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You did your job very well. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it comes down to those those little things throughout, whether it's putting her in the stinger when she was, you know, knocked unconscious or – uh, any of the promos or anything else that was going on, even even the the match I had with Razor Hawk kind of played into mm-hmm. uh, played into the eventual match I had with Solo. Well, and, and then who you, and the then who you work, lined yourself with afterwards even put that's a, that's on the page. Say. The work and the work you you and and that's the other one. Well, aside from you, I think Tony Deppen is another one that we absolutely couldn't stand. We hated seeing him come out. It was just in you guys and then putting you guys together and being fist. It was just you you just add Icarus in there and it's just. Yeah, it was it was was the, the ultimate heel faction that everybody couldn't stand. You love to hate them. Like, we don't have a lot of that today. Like, where you love to, like, oh, they're out. Like, great, great. I hope they get their ass beat. Like, you love to hate them. Yeah, I think that's that's a tough sort of thing to find. And I think some of it just comes down to not to 
turn this into a whatever sort of conversation, but I think some of that comes down to maybe egos or I don't know. I think it's time for people to think about, you know, the people growing up watching the rock, watching stone cold and wanting to be that, that person who just, you know, they does their own thing. They're anti-authoritarian. They beat everyone up and they, whatever, whatever, whatever. I think it's really difficult for people to have grown up doing that. And then, trying to be that weasel that no one likes it's a tough sort of thing to process mentally it takes a certain kind like it just makes people like stokely that much more special see i think that's what because i was a wcw fan growing up and they had them by the plenty those weaselly people that you just wanted to get see, like bischoff like uh nick patrick like even a freaking referee you wanted to see get beat up like <laughs> Like, growing up and watching that, like, even taking it back a little bit with Paulie Dangerously and the Dangerous Alliance, you wanted to see him get popped in the mouth. Like, you, they had a lot of those those weaselly-type characters. I don't think I appreciated – I don't think I appreciated a lot of them until a lot more recently when I actually started wrestling and I saw just how brilliant William Regal was, is. <laughs> yeah, he was another one. They just – he knew how to rub you the wrong way like mm-hmm. he knew knew those buttons to push and he was good at it and he didn't care like he knew he was good at it he had the facial expressions too he had the hate the face type of facial expressions yeah his his facials his his promos were fantastic the way he carried himself and then as soon as he got the upper hand he was just vicious mm-hmm that, I mean, I think the only the only really, really good one that I see today is probably MJF. Mm-hmm. Like, I think he is like kind of like the standard of those guys that are just, oh, do you just really want to see him get his ass kicked? Mm-hmm. And any role that he plays, he's always that that conniving little weasel. Yeah. And you don't really have a lot of them. Like any, everyone's either like a tough guy or it's just – or just a bad guy. There, there's not those little, those little nuances anymore. That there's these people out there that you just want to see get beat up. Like it, everyone wants to see, everyone wants to see a good match. No one wants to see someone just get their ass kicked. Yeah. It uh, it takes a special kind to be able to commit to doing that, and more power to people like MJF. Wow, that sounded like a disgusting sentence. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's that just goes to his credit the yeah. fact that i you know dislike myself for saying that sentence <laughs> now how did you feel when you were playing that role because you guys were playing that role pretty well at shakar like how were you was that kind of like a highlight or would you rather be on the other side and be the the over baby uh it's it's very tough uh i think i was good at it uh, that sort of brought its its own sort of satisfaction. I think uh, I was able to make something nice out of that story with Solo, everything there and all of that. But there would be those days when uh, like Razorhawk would tweet something at me and I would instantly just get furious. Like, why are you starting something? I'm watching netflix right now i do not want to get in a foul mood and yell at you over twitter just let me watch great british bake off like seriously (laughs) and but sure enough i would go and like have to do that and then i would be in a foul mood because i'm arguing with uh razor hawk over twitter for an hour and 15 minutes (laughs) This sounds like a very specific example. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say I say Razor Hawk because I think he was someone who liked to start stuff. Yeah. Uh, he was the opposite end. He was the really big baby face who could just poke at the bear and poke at the bear and get cheered for it. <laughs> oh my goodness. But there were definitely a few times where he would send a message and I'm just sitting there just like I don't have time for this. <laughs> uh, but now I have obligations. Damn it. Yeah. It's like, I can't just let it slide. I can't just let Razor Hawk make a smart comment. I can't let him win. Uh, 
but back back to the initial question uh it was it was very kind of very kind of rough answer i think i really found a lot of myself in wrestling when i started doing those things uh but i do think there is also that part that wants to go out and have these these banger matches and you know be able to get dumped on my head 30 times and then you know stomp on someone's foot <laughs> no is uh, that more is that more or less what you're getting back to uh yes and no uh i think i think another part that made limitless so much fun was because i got to go out there and work with people and it was just like i'm gonna do my stuff but also like uh you know let's get dead (laughs) uh so i think i i think i was able to do some of that there uh and i had a blast doing that but then also you take stuff like camp wheat frog and you know in my teaming with mikowski and that kind of stuff i get to i get to be that kind of like i think yeah i think us uh i think us if as a team in that sort of setting they're just the ones who are just gonna go around and kick sand in your face and it's like hey come on you don't have to do that but you do it anyway and it was like ah geez (laughs) how has it been teaming with uh matt mikowski he's phenomenal he is he is so good at what he does uh it's it's been fantastic to sort of see him do those things and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've been fortunate, and a lot of the people that I've been teaming up with, whether it was Deppin or Mikowski. Yeah, I think. I think the more the more we team up, the just the better it's going to get. And he's one of those guys that I was I was saying earlier about the style of kind of like a power technician. He's kind of like that hybrid of where yeah he can really beat you up, but he's also got all the holds and all the like he can take it pretty much any which way he wants to yeah and he's not someone that has to that has to rake the eyes choke you or whatever to get up the point across that he's the bad guy and you don't want to mess with him yeah i mean he's got the background already to to proceed that like he mm-hmm. he is the guy that could could beat you up yeah he could break the entire roster's arms like in a weekend <laughs> that'd be a hell of a gimmick yeah <laughs> <laughs> every every uh every match he breaks someone's arm yeah not even oh. like the opponent he goes to a random person in the in the crowd and just breaks their arm it's like a, a limb collector <laughs> uh i think there's already a few people with that he'll have a match with dominic garini and jessica troy mm, that would be a fun match yeah it would be. So, uh, Travis, before we let you go, um, obviously you can't bleed frogs, but uh, anything else coming down the road that we should know about be looking for you? Uh, I've been uh, I've been very fortunate with uh, Pizza Party. I think they're happy to bring me back when things calm down a bit. There's that stuff coming up. I think there's going to be more, more Camp Wee Frog. I've got a handful of matches at Limitless that I've already spoken about. I think they do have plans to do another season down the line. And I know they want to bring me back for that, not to spoil anything. I I think they want to bring I think they want to bring me back to it. I don't wanna I don't wanna get in trouble with anyone. (laughs) All right, well Uh, how about go ahead, finish. Uh, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> How about any of your students now? Is there anyone that you, you want to give a shout out to or anyone on any one of them that have any upcoming matches? Uh, man, what is pancakes doing? Oh man. Uh, whatever pancakes. He's, he's a, here's a weirdo. I don't know what he has coming up. <laughs> uh, one of my, 
one of my students, she is going to be debuting at the Christmas uh, holiday Camp Wheat Frog. Uh, I think that one's already been announced. I don't think I'm spoiling anything doing that. Uh, she will be having her first match there. Uh, any of my other students? Yeah, anyone? Uh, I'll be sure to blast any of my students on on Twitter and probably make fun of them and tell them to get a tan. <laughs> All right. Did you ever get that bear situation taken care of? <laughs> I was waiting for the bear to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like Beetlejuice? Do I got to say it three times? <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't said his name yet. Uh, so yeah. Like it... <laughs> <laughs> Don't even try it. Uh, I'll let you go yeah, first. Well, hopefully, hopefully see stuff. I was th going off in a completely separate thing. Um, you know, before the unfortunate passing of uh, Tracy Smothers, uh, I remember, uh, I remember speaking with someone, and they wanted to, they wanted to bring me down to Tennessee so that I could do something with him involving wrestling a bear. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, that's one of those wonderful things that didn't get to pan out but uh, that would have been so much fun just go down there and learn how to wrestle a bear from Tracy Smothers yeah, that's, a, that's a story you take forever you just, yeah. <laughs> that's like turns into like your number one story like oh yeah well I wrestled a bear <laughs> oh my god yeah that's 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 the goal you know, one day, one day, be able to interact with a bear. That that's that's the big goal. It's like, you know, bear, WWE. <laughs> All right, Travis. I, I like how your top, your top one was this high, and then your your mid card. Yeah, well, WWE was, I was significantly I was worried, lower. I was, oh, I was worried about uh, you know. Cutting the, it off the screen. The video. You had, oh, okay. you, had, you had bear at the top of your head. You had WWE down at the nipple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right, all right. Maybe, maybe like eh. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. God, God forbid. Travis. God forbid Vince gets mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vince himself can respect someone who wants to wrestle a bear, though. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But uh, Travis, thanks so much for taking the time and being on the show and talking with us. And uh, hopefully we'll be uh, talking to you really soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. All right. Have a good night. Yeah, you too.